Thank you, Roland, for the wonderful introduction. And um, thank you to all uh, the organizers, Roland, you know, Brigitte, and um, David for the invitation uh, to the program and also for um, the occasion to speak. So um, the work that I'm going to uh, present today um, is all joint work with Jonathan Book, uh, who's at Stanford. And um, this uh, talk will concern <laughs> nonlinear waves um, is uh, the, the program is um, all about, but with um, motivation, a lot of motivation from general relativity. So I'll try to address both um, aspects um, in the talk. So, so here's the, um, I guess, plan for the talk. And by the way, I should ask you, um, so uh, yeah, usually um, when I prepare slides, I give in to the urge of preparing too much. And um, I think I also uh, prepared too much today, but I'd much rather you know, skip a few um, slides uh, rather than, you know, um, and, you know, have you guys understand some things other, rather than, you know, me just going through the slides at like, like speed. So um, uh, please stop me and you know, ask me questions whenever you have, you know, anything, okay? All right, so uh, let's begin. Okay, so as I said, uh, we'll be considering nonlinear wave equations. Um, and here I just wrote down, like, the most general form of nonlinear wave equation you can think of, where on the left-hand side I, you know, collected all the, um, you know, linear terms. G should be you know, have um, signature minus one plus plus, you know, plus one plus 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 to be a uh, hyperbolic equation. But other than that, um, yeah, this is basically a general thing you can think about. You know, I'm allowing this to be, uh, you know, quasi-linear. And, you know, these nonlinear wave equations, of course, um, come up, uh, you know, in many, uh, universally in many theories of physics, uh, you know, most notably general relativity which would be um, a example that I'll try to focus on um, as, an, as a motivation. And the question we'll be interested in is um, of the global symptotics of phi, which was also discussed in, you know, um, other talks in this um, in the conference so far, including, you know, Daniel's and also um, Mihalas. And um, so, uh, and taking cue also, I guess, from um, how Daniel uh, set things up, let me start with uh, the simplest case. You know, let's start with the constant coefficient um, case to you know, um, establish expectations and formulate the question that we want to ask. So um, let's just think about the linear wave equation, solution to linear wave equation. And you know, let's just uh, you know, consider the um, case when the initial data is you know, as nice as possible, so smooth and complex supported data. We can you know, solve this using fundamental solution, right? This is in um, you know, Evans PD book chapter two. I just taught a PD class, so um, I know where it is. Um, so, um, and you know, if you just use that and you know, write down how the solution looks like, then um, and plot it, you know, on I don't know, uh, in the space time, then um, you see that you have the following behavior. Let's say that um, the you know support of the initial data is in this um, region over here, which is um, I'm drawing basically the uh, this in the TR coordinates. So this is um, the this is the ball. Um, by finding superior propagation, of course, um, the wave is zero outside of um, a light cone that emanates from this ball. And then, you know, most of um, the solution will be basically traveling at the speed of light, and therefore, you know, it's this part, um, you know, uh, which is basically of distance um, one from the light cone that I drew over here, where the solution will be biggest. And we also know how the solution, how big the solution is. Um, it, it, it's, you know, um, offside. The amplitude is of size t to the power d minus one over two, which is the um, dispersive, um, you know, estimate, right? And um, and then there's this blue region where um, this phi is um, you know, less big. This is um, uh, will be uh, smaller. And um, the problem that I want to consider in this talk is um, take a nonlinear wave, you know, general nonlinear wave equation on the asymptotic flat background, and I want to understand the asymptotics of phi in this blue region, basically. So, you know, if you want um, to be ambitious, you can say, okay, trying to understand the asymptotics in this blue region um, is the problem. Uh, or, you know, um, if you want to be more concrete, you can just fix a um, you know, value of x and just try to ask, okay, what's the asymptotics of phi when x is fixed and we just take time to infinity? So this must be distinguished with um, the region uh, where you see dispersive decay um, you know, so this is the region where x, where phi is, um, you know, smaller, right? So this is not where um, phi is the biggest. 
So um, usually, when you study nonlinear waves, um, you the first thing you are interested in is to understand um, the waves, you know, where it's biggest, and to try to show that you know um, its decay rate is, uh, you know, its um, behavior is like that of the linear wave equation, in particular that it decays. And this is the main stable, main usually the main mechanism for proving stability of nonlinear waves, as we've seen in many other talks in the, in this conference, right? Um, now, what sort of uses would understanding asymptotics like this, you know, um, which I'm calling late time tail, have for you know understanding nonlinear waves? Well, I guess a simple way to put it is this is the um, region that you want to look at. This is the asymptotics that you want to understand. If your if your problem has not only wave that radiates but also something that you know, just sits there and is spatially localized, for instance, a solid tongue. So you know, um, the asymptotics of the wave along this region would be what a solid tongue that sits you know, at that um, you know, point will see. Right? And since we are in GR, we, um, we can also talk about a you know, um, distinguished spatially localized sol solution in GR, which are black holes. And in fact, um, the motivation for um, Jonathan and I to think about this problem came from a problem in GR, and more specifically, um, uh, in the study of um, understanding the singularity structure inside black holes. So um, even though this is not going to be directly relevant for the main theorem of the, um, of the talk, this is our main motivation. So I wanted to spend you know, maybe a few slides on you know, the story behind um, the singularity structure inside black holes and how the, the problem of late time tails um, are relevant to this. Okay. Because um, at first it might, not, it might seem like completely different problems. So um, what are these black hole solutions? Um, these are you know, special solutions to uh, Einstein vacuum equation, which is in, suitable, you know, in a suitable way to write it, a nonlinear wave equation for the metric G on this um, uh, manifold M usually taken to be uh, three plus one dimensional. Um, and like one of the amazing facts about GR that you, know, um, you are already probably familiar with is that there are um, explicit solutions to these equations that, um, re that represent um, black holes. So uh, you know, uh, examples uh, include the Schwarzschild black hole, which, represent, which, is a, uh, which you can think of as a family of um, solutions to the Einstein vacuum equation, parents by a parameter m, which is, um, and you know, this metric uh, represents a static black hole with mass m. Okay, so m is the mass parameter, and Kerr black holes. Um, so this is a, a two-parameter family of um, space times or metrics, uh, and parameters are m and a. This represents a stationary but rotating black hole uh, with mass m, and um, a represents basically how much it's rotating. Um, and black hole refers to, um, in its precise sense, uh, refers to a subregion of, you know, such a space-time that cannot reach, that cannot, you know, uh, I guess shoot signal um, to infinitely far away observers, um, even by, you know, ball curves, even, you know, um, at the speed of light. So when you think about these space-times, um, these space-times are supposed to be isolated um, astrophysical body. So, um, you know, mathematically, this means that we're thinking about asymptotically flat. Um, solutions. So there will be some notion of radius, and as the radius gets large, um, our metric will look more and more like the flat case, Minkowski space time. And as a result, you know, since we're not in the black hole, right, we are far away in Earth and we're you know, seeing the black hole, we as observers, from the point of view of the space time, are, you know, sort of at infinity. So um, this is, we are, you know, this infinitely far away observers represent us, basically. So, you know, that's sort of how this notion of black holes Oh, sorry, I don't know what happened. Um, yeah, uh, I guess makes precise this um, is is made precise. And um, so, since black hole is the subregion of space time, we can we can distinguish you know outside of the black hole and inside the black hole, right? And outside of the black hole, um, these two metrics are you know very similar, at least when a is very very small, you know, which is what you expect, right? I mean, not rotating and slowly rotating should look pretty similar, right? And um, in, in, you know, in the black hole exterior, uh, there have been amazing developments concerning their nonlinear stability by you know, various authors, um, uh, well, which, I'm not, which I'm not gonna go into. But um, the story in the interior of the black hole is very, very different. So um, here I drew um, 
uh, what are called Penrose diagrams for the uh, terrestrial black hole here and the curved black hole here, which is a way to represent the causal structure of the space times. So, um, <coughs> Uh, it's these kind of things that's, I guess, you know, if you already know it, there, you know, um, I don't need to explain. And um, if you don't know it, um, it's hard to explain. <laughs> Let me try my best. So, um, you know, the key thing that's, ha you know, that you should, um, that you should, um, you know, understand when you look at this picture is that um, this is the depiction of the space time. And the key rule is that, you know, 45 degrees um, represent the speed of light and, you know, um, upward direction represent um, you know, going forward in time. And we've compactified the, um, the depiction so that you know, um, here, what I drew in dotted lines and you know, what I drew is um, these uh, circles, empty circles, represent actually infinity. Okay, so these are not part of the system, this is infinity. Um, and this infinity is basically where we are. This is, you know, uh, this is sort of um, what's called null infinity. Uh, this is where far away observers sit. And um, the region that you cannot reach by um, uh, you know, curves that's 45 degrees forward, you know, upwards, um, is by definition the black hole region. So for Schwarzschild, this is the black hole region. For Kerr, this is the black hole region. And don't ask me about this, this other part, okay? So let's, let's ignore that for the moment. So let's just focus on um, what's happening here. So you see, um, for these explicit solutions, you see that you know, outside, the picture looks similar, but inside, even the picture looks very different. And um, you know, uh, it's not only the pictures, but actually the nature of the boundary of the space-time I drew that are very, very different. So in Schwarzschild space-time, if you go inside the black hole um, and you look at the, um, the, the boundary of the space-time, then this is singular in sort of every sense you can imagine. For instance, um, you know, uh, through this, through this um, you know, uh, hypersurface, you cannot extend metric G even as a continuous metric. Um, meanwhile, uh, for the uh, Kerr um, black hole, um, first of all, this uh, boundary looks very different, right? Um, it has different causal character, but I guess more drastically, what's very different is that this boundary is a perfectly smooth boundary through the space-time in the sense of, you know, manifold with, with boundary. So um, <clears throat> it is the boundary of the space-time in the sense that this is the maximal extent that we can determine the solution as a solution to the Einstein equation from the data that's complete. You know, there's no meaningful way to extend the data. So this is sort of, you know, all the maximal development, right? Um, but then, so, you know, um, but then the boundary of the maximal development is very smooth. Locally, there's nothing going wrong. So, you know, given these very, you know, contrasting pictures um, in the catalog of explicit black hole solutions we have, the question that arises is, how the singularities in generic or physical black holes behave. You know, does it take this, pic this picture or does it take this picture? So strong cosmic censorship um, made by Penrose is basically a statement in, um, that tried to say that um, this behavior in Kerr that we just discussed is not physical. Okay? You want to rule this out. So um, <clears throat> the mathematical uh, statement of the strong cosmic sensor conjecture, uh, usually it goes like this. For generic asymptotically flat initial data, the maximal Cauchy development, maximal development as a solution to the Einstein vacuum equation, should be inextendable as a suitably regular or Lorentzian manifold. Okay? So here, you know, um, you, are, you have a maximal development, but it's extendable, you know, um, in every any sense you want, basically, right? So um, this would be a counterexample to the statement over here. But it wants to say that that's a non-generic um, situation. Generically, you know, um, this should not happen. And you know, um, basically, I'm using genericity uh, synonymously with the word um, physical. Okay, so like, so physical black holes should not look like um, this. That's what the conjecture is trying to say. And in particular, um, in the case of Kerr uh, that you know we discussed, the strong cosmic censorship should say that this um, boundary of the maximal development called the Cauchy horizon uh, should be non-generic. Um, in other words, it should be unstable under you know, ever so small perturbations of the current initial data. And um, somehow, uh, this perfectly smooth Cauchy horizon should turn into some sort of a singularity. So that's what the strong cosmic sensor would say in the case of um, the Kerr 
or space time. Okay? And there is a very interesting development um, you know, regarding how to make this uh, you know, intentionally vague phrase, phrasing of the conjecture precise. Um, some highlights include the works of Daphromus and Daphromus Look, who uh, you know, identify that suitably regular does not mean C0 metric, which is the thing that you'd guess if I, ju if I just showed you this, right? Because this was, this was the only other alternative, right? So um, there's more going on there. And um, another, I guess, um, thing that I could mention is that um, basically, uh, in view of this phenomenon, the, um, uh, one of the uh, sort of most important uh, formulation of suitably regular is to say that um, by suitably regular, we mean extension with um, H1 lock metric. And H1 lock has the significance that it's the least regularity that you need in order to even write down the reformulation of the Einstein equation. Anyways, um, you know, uh, keeping these aside, so um, you know, here I just rewrote the strong cosmic censorship, uh, you know, um, near the statement of strong cosmic censorship conjecture um, for data that's near Kerr. And um, this problem is currently wide open. But um, <clears throat> uh, we wanted to approach this problem, and sort of our um, starting point was um, a joint work um, in 2019, uh, where we resolved this conjecture, strong cosmic energy conjecture, in a, a strictly symmetric model problem called the Einstein Maxwell uncharged scalar field to end asymptotic flat data problem, um, where we basically divided the problem into um, two parts. So the problem is basically, you know, um, that of proving generic instability of the, you know, of the structure of the interior of the black hole, right? So how do we approach this? Step one, we say that for generic perturbations um, on the boundary of the black hole, we have to see something non-trivial. That's the first step. So we analyze the exterior of the black hole and we say that, you know, generically, there's something non-trivial happening um, on the boundary of the black hole. And then step two is I take that as the input and say that this non-trivial um, behavior on the boundary of the black hole uh, feeds into the instability mechanism inside the black hole, uh, which is called blue shift instability. Um, and that leads to this uh, formation of singularity. Right? So that's the, that's the, um, uh, the, there was the big sort of um, blueprint. And um, <clears throat> as in this work, um, you know, the reason why we were interested in this um, you know, late time tail problem was that we expected that this would play an important role in resolving this conjecture as well, which is outside the symmetry. Okay? So that's the motivation that, um, uh, that we had coming into this problem. And in view of this motivation, it's important that um, you know, we, our methods for understanding late time tails allow for dynamical space times, right? Um, and also nonlinear equations because we eventually want to think about the Einstein equation. And uh, we also need to say that something non-trivial is generically there on the boundary. You know, we, so we on, not only need upper bounds, but we also need lower bounds on the tail. Okay? So those are sort of parameters that's given to us for this problem because we're interested in this um, strong cosmic sensor conjecture. And interestingly, it turns out that um, the parity of the dimension makes a big difference in this problem. The fact that um, we live in, uh, we seem to live in, uh, you know, three spatial dimension, and the fact that three is odd, uh, makes the late time tail behavior difficult to determine. Even the determination of what the rates should be is a non-trivial problem. And even for the simplest problem that you can think of, linear wave on a you know, stationary black hole space time. So this was resolved um, uh, by influential, uh, this was um, the proposed, the answer to this was proposed um, in um, the work of uh, uh, Richard Price in the um, 70s, I think. Um, and this led to a whole field called um, Price's Law, and I'll talk about it soon, okay? But I wanna emphasize that somehow this is non-trivial because D is odd. And um, second thing I want to um, you know, uh, point out um, you know, is that uh, it turns out that because we are moving outside of symmetry, spherical symmetry, the problem also takes another twist. So non spherically symmetric late time tails turns out to behave very differently from spherically symmetric case in the presence of nonlinear or dynamic backgrounds. Okay? So these are the things that I wanted to, I, I like to um, 
uh, I guess um, show you um, in, in this presentation. Okay, but let's um, let's uh, start with um, the first point. So I want to first tell you why um, the parity of the dimension matters. Okay, why um, the problem is much har harder because we're living in three plus one dimensional you know, world instead of say two plus one or four plus one dimensional world. So um, this can be understood just by um, going back to the original, the, the basic example that we, you know, of the linear wave equation, and trying to understand what's the late time tail um, there. And you see that there is stark difference depending on the dimension. So when the dimension is even, you can, um, you know, show that uh, just by looking at the fundamental solution, that um, phi must um, behave, you know, if you fix x and take t to infinity, it must assume total to some constant times t to the power minus d minus one, and this constant will be non-zero non generically. And um, in fact, once you see this, you might realize, oh, actually, you, you know, um, I should have known this from before, because this is exactly the number, um, you know, that you expect from scaling, right? So um, you have a d plus one, you have a second order equation in a d plus one dimensional, you know, um, space, right? So by scaling, um, you know, this behavior should be d minus one. This is exactly the same way you read off the decay of the Newtonian potential or Laplace equation, right? Um, and this rate uh, is, that you see already for the linear wave equation is expected to be stable under perturbations of the equation. So, you know, if we lived in the two or four plus dimensional worlds, this would have been my, my initial guess. And I would have, you know, um, tried to ju um, justify this as the late time tail. However, as we know very well, when um, D is odd, um, then the behavior of the fundamental solution is very different because we have the strong Huygens principle. So the fundamental solution is supported not, you know, just on the boundary of the future light cone and not in the interior, right? And as a result, um, if you start from, you know, compact initial data, then phi actually eventually becomes zero at some point if you fix x and take t to infinity, right? So actually, um, you know, for the base problem when d is equal to three, uh, the answer to the, the question of late time tail is highly degenerate Um, so the, you know, the hope is that, well, um, nevertheless, there's, there's hope that there's, you know, on late time tail for, you know, not exactly linear wave equation, because it's very well known in many aspects that the strong Huygens principle is unstable. But on the other hand, you know, this tells you that there's no easy way to think of, you know, to guess the, the rate for the late time tail as in the even dimensional case. Let's, you know, think, let's, let me um, give you an example to, um, to illustrate the generation of late time tail by violation of Huygens principle by perturbing the equation. So let's start with the uh, linear wave equation. And, you know, let's add the following metric perturbation, okay? So I'm going to work in um, the u, r, theta coordinates, okay? Where um, u is a variation, u is the retarded time, so instead of t, I'm gonna use t minus r as my time, you know, because this has the significance that um, you know, this is null, okay? So every, uh, you know, the level hypersurface of this are, this are the um, outgoing null cones that we saw in the picture before. And um, let's consider in this coordinate um, a linear wave, perturbation of the linear wave equation of this form, okay? Where um, a, we're gonna to assume to be, you know, small, and decaying um, like power, you know, uh, have a power like decay like R2 minus one. And let's, you know, just cut away, cut away uh, the region near the origin to not worry about it, okay? I don't want to think about the origin because, you know, I'm thinking about polar coordinates. Um, then, uh, with the known methods that I'm going to review on soon, it can be shown that as long as this perturbation is non-trivial, uh, you have the following rate for the tail for generic solutions. And notice that this power d that we see here is actually faster, okay? So this is bigger than the d minus one rate that we saw for the even dimensional case. So this already suggests that there's some cancellation going on, okay? Um, and you can actually do the same thing. Since A is chosen to be spherically symmetric, you can, um, so this will respect localization into um, spherical harmonics. So if I start with data that's supported on the Lth spherical harmonics, then, you know, the solution will remain the same way. And in that case, um, the tail would change, and you will pick up extra um, minus 2L um, in the rate. Okay. So why did I consider this problem 
well, um, I consider this problem because this is a, actually a nice model for um, the linear wave equation on an actual black hole space time. So um, this is uh, <coughs> the aforementioned work of Price, who studied the problem of um, late time tails in the language that I'm, you know, uh, I just set up um, for the linear wave equation on the three plus one dimensional Schwarzschild black hole. Okay. So um, basically, in this paper, um, <coughs> what Price um, has uh, proposed uh, through formal and, um, uh, you know, uh, arguments was the following, that if you look at the wave, the geometrically natural wave equation on the exterior region of the uh, Schwarzschild black hole, this is the explicit um, uh, expression of the metric, um, where phi has initial data that's compactly supported, and let's also assume that phi, um, you know, is maybe supported in the harmonics of degree L, then um, the rate that you see, the rate and tail for the solution phi should be t to the minus 2L minus 3. And in some sort of, you know, uh, reformulation of the notion of time, this is also the rate you're gonna see um, for the <coughs> solution phi along the um, boundary of the black hole. Okay. And notice that this is the same number as, 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 as before, phi is three. And um, <coughs> Price's law had been um, studied uh, extensively, uh, both in um, physics and um, mathematics, and um, by now, actually, the statement that I just made has a well-established proof, um, thanks to the contribution of actually people, many of, uh, people, many of whom are here in the audience. Um, so uh, so the, the statement that I, that I gave is basically a theorem. So um, the first thing that was proved was the upper bound part of, of the prediction that I wrote. So um, this is... Um, in the spherically symmetric case, uh, you know, proved in the, uh, with non-linearity, uh, proved in the work of Stefan Lubinansky, and then outside of symmetry, there were works of um, Daniel, and then Roland, and, um, and others who established this. In, uh, and moreover, the lower bound, or more precisely, the asymptotics is now, by now, well known as well. So this is the work of uh, Angelopoulos, Artakis, Gaich, and um, Hens, uh, who use different methods. Uh, more generally, more general things are known. Uh, we know that the theorem actually holds on, you know, not just Schwarzschild black hole, but on a large class of asymptotically flat stationary space times. And if the space time is frequently symmetric, then this statement for, you know, L holds too. And um, the upper bound is even more general, and they also hold on dynamical space time. Okay. And there are, you know, many, many um, other um, contributions um, to the literature. I cannot um, do justice in this um, short time. I, I, I hope you forgive me that I cannot go over all these work. Um, and I, I also hope you forgive me if I missed your work. Sorry about that. Okay, I try my best, but um, <laughs> okay. So um, here are the main questions that I wanna um, ask after setting up all these, um, all these uh, things. First question is, uh, what happens to Price's law if we change the setting? Okay, so Price's law was derived in the linear and, and stationary case, right? But as we said, if you, you know, because in view of at least our motivation, I want to think about um, you know, what happens when you have dynamical space time and also when you have nonlinearity. Okay. And more generally, um, we want to ask, is there a way to you know, compute this um, rate you know, of this uh, you know, rate of decay of latent tail that, that more easily? So um, you know, in the and basically, um, what, I'm, what, I like, what I'll try to do is to present a positive answer to question two, which, um, which is the content of our main theorem. Um, but then, uh, <coughs> before I present to you the main theorem, I wanted to actually discuss um, some um, applications of the main theorem to try to answer um, question one, because it turns out that um, the answer to this um, is quite subtle. Okay. Any questions so far? Great, um, so let's go to uh, part two. So let's, now I'm going to uh, present with you, I guess, um, string of examples, which are, I guess, um, some of them are designed so that they're a bit confusing, at least, <laughs> to illustrate that um, the phenomenon of lake and tail is very subtle because, um, you know, when, when the spatial dimension is odd, okay? But then, um, so 
but then I'll try to uh, make sense of things at the end, and I'll try to uh, come up with some reasonable conjecture that's relevant to the original problem that I ask in, in GR. And also I'll try to explain to you how to understand all these, uh, which is the content of our main theorem, okay? But here are the examples first. So um, let's start with this example that we already considered, which, was, which I told you was a good model, analytic model, okay? Simpler analytic model for thinking about structure. Okay? So think about this wave equation. I told you that the um, generic latent tail has the rate t to the minus t. Okay. okay, instead of the metric perturbation, let's consider, you know, I don't know, seemingly simpler problem, which is a potential. And let's make this have the same homogeneity as the one that I have here. So let's make this k like r to the minus three. And um, you know, in, in three dimension, you can you know, use the assistant method to um, compute its uh, asymptotics, and you realize that the answer is the same as, um, as before. So it's also t to the minus t, t is equal to three. Okay, so let's, let's, let's try to generalize. How about the next odd dimension, d is equal to five? Well, I wouldn't be asking this question if the answer was five, right? So the answer turns out to be not five, it's actually six. There's an extra cancellation. As I told you, the reason why we consider this model is because you know, I'm taking this model as, an, as a model for um, you know, black hole wave equation on the black hole spacetime, structural black hole spacetime. So actually, a similar thing happens if you consider um, higher dimensional uh, structural black hole, if you consider the linear wave equation on the higher dimensional structural black hole. So again, you know, um, the setup is you know, there are some you know, numerology that you can think about. So this is the, how the metric looks like. There's some numerology you can think about. And if you plug in the numerology, then, you know, um, you, you know, you get the guess t to the minus seven. And um, it turns out that uh, this is wrong. Um, so this turns out to be the correct rate if you think about a generic stationary metric with um, decay, generic distribution metric, which is a perturbation of the Minkowski metric, uh, which has the same decay rate as this. However, for exact structural space time, there are further cancellation. And actually, in this time, um, the order is greater than uh, you know, the, the, um, the example before. So, um, and in fact, this was not, um, and the answer turns out to be t to the minus 10. And if you like, I can give you even more amusing example, which I didn't write here. So if you think about what's called the Weichner Nordstrom um, black hole, which is charged black hole, and I, then, the, the, then the result is that um, for all except one parameter of the electric, uh, of the um, charge parameter, the latent tail has the rate t to minus 10, where, this is, where there is one value of e that I don't remember, where this actually gets canceled, and you have t to minus 12. <laughs> okay. And um, I should say, this was already suggested um, in you know, some uh, works by, uh, by physicists, but this is um, the first rigorous proof. All right, so um, this demonstrates that um, the you know, question of determining this rate is finicky. I hope you know, this example uh, at least piques your interest of, you know, for this problem. Okay, let's um, pass to nonlinear equations. So you know, our method also, sure, yeah, yeah, please, of course, yeah. That's a good question. We can compute it. I didn't compute it. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, okay. So um, you know, let me just give you a quick nonlinear example. So um, let's consider a nonlinear wave equation with so-called null condition. So it's a quadratic nonlinear equation where the nonlinearity has some structure so that it, it doesn't form um, finite time blow up. It has some um, small data global existence. Um, the global existence or small data. Uh, to this equation was proved in the 80s by Krizzolulu and Kleinemann um, separately. Kleinemann used the vector field method and Krizzolulu introduced, used what's called the conformal method. And if you know these methods, you know that if you use the conformal method, then you get the upper bound t to the minus two uh, for, uh, for the tail for this problem. The question is, um, is, this, is this the rate uh, for uh, you know, this problem? Again, actually, the problem turns out to be highly dependent on the linear part of the problem and also the nonlinear part. So there are examples, and in some sense, generic examples uh, would actually see this decay rate t to the minus two. However, for many examples um, of interest, uh, you know, this rate will be different from t to the minus two. 
here's a stupid example. Um, you know, there's this example that we always like to write, which is box phi is equal to this equation where phi is just a, you know, um, a scalar function, and this gamma, this gamma is just one. This looks like a nonlinear equation, but you know, in fact, it's not a nonlinear equation because you can transform it by this exponential um, you know, function to a solution to a linear wave equation. But we know that the linear wave equation has strong Huygens principle, so this doesn't have a tail. So we have an example of an equation where we don't have a tail. So um, uh, to, you know, we don't have a general answer to this, but um, you know, let me just um, illustrate an um, example of such an equation where um, you, know, you can determine the rate um, depending on the geometric properties of nonlinearity. So I have in mind the wave map system, which was already discussed in this um, conference, uh, which is a generalization of um, you know, linear waves into um, you know, uh, maps that takes value into a, um, in a uh, Riemannian manifold. Let's take the target for simplicity to be a two-dimensional Riemannian manifold. And um, let's think about perturbations of the constant map okay, for um, uh, a solution to this problem. And let's denote by P this um, constant uh, that, you know, that this map is perturbation of. And um, you know, uh, for this problem, you can apply the method of crystal alignment and show small data global stability. And for this problem, it turns out that the latent tail depends on the curvature of the uh, manifold at the point P. So um, in short, if the curvature is non-trivial at P, then um, the rate is T2 minus three. But if the curvature vanishes at zero, uh, vanishes at P, then um, you have one order cancellation and the rate is at least T2 minus four. And you might imagine go, you know, like playing this game or you know, like higher and higher orders. Uh, we didn't um, get, get to do it, but uh, yeah. Okay, finally, um, let me also discuss the effect of introducing non-stationarity or dynamics to the coefficients. Let's come back to the linear um, equation, the linear example that we talked about. Um, <coughs> but then uh, let's now add um, time dependence to the coefficient. Okay, so I'm sticking with the same uh, model equation, which I believe is a good model for you know, a wave equation and Schwarzschild, but now I'm adding um, time dependence in the coefficient. Okay, so um, <coughs> let's take this to be of the same form. So we want, we want A to look like R2 minus one times some coefficient for large R. Um, but then you know, we're gonna assume that this epsilon is now time dependent. So in this case, what we prove is that um, in general, the rate uh, of the latent tail actually um, uh, it's different. So for um, generic compactly supported data um, that's supported with in spherical mode greater than equal to L, um, the latent tail looks like this. Notice that, um, and okay, so um, what happens is the following. Um, if D is equal to three, and you know, um, if L is equal to zero, so you know, when you think about the D is equal to three and the sprinkler symmetric problem, or general problem in D is equal to three, um, you have the decay rate T2 minus three, which, which is what you saw from before. But if, you are, uh, if you deviate from um, this, uh, I don't know why I write this, if you deviate in any way from, um, from this uh, you know, um, case, then the rate becomes T to the D minus 2L plus one, which is actually um, you know, one order slower than the rate um, that's consistent with Price's law. So um, yeah, so that's exactly what I just said. And um, as I said, um, this again, um, we considered because um, this is a good model for dynamical black holes that's settling down to Schwarzschild. And in fact, the phenomenon that, we just, um, that I just showed you, that um, for higher, uh, for instance, if I fix D is equal to three, or higher spherical modes that, um, you know, on a dynamical black hole, the solution to the linear wave equation has a slower latent tail, has been observed and proposed um, in the physics literature, actually. Um, so, and you can actually even see this phenomenon in the very early work um, that studied um, this, this, um, this question um, in the paper of Gunlock, Price, and Pullet from 1994. So this is a figure um, that I borrowed from um, that paper. Um, and actually, uh, if you look at um, the rates uh, that they read off for L is equal to zero, one, two, three, um, it's minus 2.77, minus 3.95, minus you know, 5.94, minus 
as opposed to the in prices law rates minus three, five, seven, nine. Okay, so um, this, this is definitely more like four than five. This is definitely more like six than seven, right? And this is a little bit more like eight than at nine. So this is already seen in the numerics all in, in, from the 90s. And um, I highlighted this in blue because um, actually it was revisited in the 2000s by Bizon, Shumai, and Rosarovsky, who emphasized um, that, you know, um, this, this difference. Sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So that's a great question. So uh, of course, you know, um, these uh, statements regarding L, um, you know, makes sense only for spherical symmetric um, backgrounds. But there's a reason why I'm keeping all these Ls because I'm going to use them as proxy to modeling, you know, more um, uh, modeling um, other linear wave equations that's more relevant to Einstein equation, namely um, the linearized gravitational um, waves and, and Maxwell equation, for instance. Huh? On you? Exactly, yes. As long as this is frequently symmetric, um, uh, it's, it's okay, yeah. Any other questions? How much time do I have? Eight minutes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so with an eye towards strong cosmic censorship, um, as we said, um, it was important to allow dynamical space times and nonlinear equations. And, um, uh, and as we've seen, um, these features should lead to a different behavior um, that's, uh, you know, uh, compared to the linear stationary case. And um, based on, you know, um, the observations uh, that we made um, here, okay. Oh, by the way, sorry, I, I, sorry that I skipped this slide, but this slide just basically says that um, the same result as I described here holds for um, dynamical perturbations of Schwarzschild. So you know, thinking about the linear wave equation on a dynamical perturbation of Schwarzschild that converges to Schwarzschild, um, and we rigorously verify and settle the scenario suggested by on these, these uh, um, uh, physics papers. Okay, so um, what I wanted to say was that um, these features should lead to a behavior that's different from the linear station case, and um, therefore we make the following conjecture um, regarding the um, you know, solutions to the Einstein vacuum equation that com converges to um, curve, or even more generally, that converges to a asymptotically flat spatial solution. And we, 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 um, our conjecture is that um, in this nonlinear and dynamical setting, the, the latent pale should be p to the minus six instead of p to the minus seven, which is the predictive rate for Price's law. Um, and the, the reason why uh, we, we are thinking about six and seven is um, because uh, we are using the idea that gravitational perturbations are very similar to scalar perturbations that are supported in spherical modes L greater than equal to two. So this, these are the numerology for L is equal to two from the previous um, uh, theorem. And in this formulation, the spherical symmetry of the background doesn't matter. And um, an analysis condition can be made for Maxwell equation. Um, and in this case, the L number will be four. And actually, this is consistent with the general upper bound that was already proved by, in the work of McHale, Tarrant, Twin, and you. So um, there was a good reason why um, you know, Daniel and his collaborators uh, proved just four. I guess that was sharp. <laughs> I, that's my conjecture. Anyways, okay, so back to the main questions. In the remaining maybe five minutes, I want to, um, you know, uh, state the main theorem and tell you how we determine all these, um, you know, answers, okay, and tell you sort of how, what's involved in, um, uh, in the process. So, um, the statement of the theorem is wrong, so I, um, I prepared an executive summary before, you know, um, to, before showing you the full, full theorem. So um, in a nutshell, the main theorem that we proved recently um, says that there is an algorithm to determine the late time of of generic solutions. Um, and this applies to possibly even nonlinear wave equations on you know, possibly dynamical space times. So the main theorem basically reduces the complicated PD problem to um, that of ODEs, or more precisely, a recurrence relation that's consisting of ODEs. Okay? So this is something formal that you can compute uh, by just looking at the nonlinear equation. And that's why, how you can form the expectation or the rate 
and then you know you can you can try you can prove it. That's what the theorem says. Um, the main theorem actually always one consequence of the main theorem is that it tells you that generally you have an upper bound of p to the minus t minus one, which is actually consistent with the picture that we saw. Um, you know in the even dimensional case, and this you know, is consistent with the scaling heuristics that we had. Um, and it turns out that Price's law can be thought of as, in this framework, the special consequence of linearity and stationarity. It turns out that if you have linear equation, which is stationary, there is always at least one order of cancellation. So uh, just, you know, like, just like um, Price's law. Um, and you know the other examples that I showed you of Schwarzschild, higher dimensional Schwarzschild black hole correspond to anomalous um, cancellations. Uh, you know that are present in many many ODEs. You know these are these are possible. However, uh, what we also show through our method, what you can also see through our method is that these cancellations in ODEs are very very unstable. These cancellations that come from linearity and stationarity are very very unstable. So ever so slight um, perturbation by a nonlinearity or a non-stationary coefficient can break it. Okay, so um, the main theorem, okay, so I think I'll, I'll try to, I think I started uh, three minutes late, so, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Um, already counted in, but never mind. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay, um, you can stop me anytime, no. so, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so let me uh, first tell you the, uh, the assumptions um, of the theorem. So um, this is highly, I guess, um, uh, simplified statement of the main assumptions of the theorem. So um, our theorem applies in the following, uh, following context. So you know, consider when the linear part of the, of the nonlinear wave equation is asymptotically flat. This means that as R goes to infinity, you approach Minkowski and also ultimately stationary. So as um, the time parameter tau goes to infinity, um, it must approach a stationary problem. And here this tau is um, a smooth sort of interpolation of the usual time in a region where r is bounded, and um, basically the retarded time u when r is large. Okay, so in, on, in those foliations, you approach a stationary problem. In this direction, you approach um, a, you know, the Minkowski um, problem. We need for the nonlinearity the null condition when d is equal to three. Um, a spatial cancellation structure for the quadratic nonlinearity. Um, and we need an assumption on uh, what we call P infinity P, uh, infinity P zero. So infinity P is the uh, wave operator that this P would um, you know, uh, converge to. This is a stationary operator that this P would converge to as tau goes to infinity. And you know, from this, uh, you drop the time derivative um, and you, know, you get some operator. This is uh, what we call P infinity zero. And we want this to um, be invertible uh, you know, with suitable estimates. Um, this is analogous to what's called a um, low resonance or eigenvalue condition at, at zero energy. And finally, um, you know, we assume that phi has smooth and complex support data um, and that the solution obeys some weak decay estimates. So under these conditions, um, you know, we, we, our theorem says that the latent tail is dictated by the following data, the expansion of the solution in, in the powers of R, and these are functions of U and theta near infinity, and also some spatial profile that's determined by, I forgot to put the infinity here, P infinity on zero. So how is the latent tail determined? Um, it's determined as follows. Forget about the blue you know, um, uh, letters, just let's focus on this. So the latent tail um, always takes this following form, where there's some coefficient times um, some spatial profile, eta, times you know, this, this t to some power where there's this parameter j that we must determine. And the key objects here are j, eta, and l, and these are determined as follows. You start with the expansion of phi into powers of r you know, um, for each fixed u and theta. This is, um, and you have to multiply by r to the power d minus over two to get a non-trivial limit. And this is called the Friedlander radiation. Um, and uh, you know, the property of this is that you, know, um, you can think of a, a formal series like this, and you realize that um, you know, these coefficients uh, satisfy recurrence relations um, in terms of ODEs. So if you solve the ODEs, you can determine the higher coefficients, or um, Pj, in terms of um, the lowest coefficient, P0. Okay? But this is a formal thing that you can do. Right? So you didn't have to even know that there's a solution to this. This is something you can compute. 
Now j would be defined as the smallest integer such that um, phi j of u has non-trivial limit as u goes to infinity. And we're going to define this L that appears in the coefficient as the limit. This S0 is nothing but the projection to the L spherical harmonics. So S0 is the spherical average, you know, projection to the zero harmonics. And the spatial profile eta um, solves um, the equation infinity P0 eta is equal to zero with suitable boundary condition at spatial infinity. That's how these are determined. But if I only give you this, the theorem will be true, but actually it won't be very useful because I'm telling you that you know, um, the, the question of determining tail you know, is turned into some other question, but there is this fundamental unknown, P0, that you, you don't know, right? So um, a crucial um, addition to this rule is what we call the correction rule, which is actually what makes it work and what gives this sort of the power to compute um, the rates. And this, this says the following. If you look at the Lth spherical harmonics of Pj, the jth um, coefficient here, then it necessarily has to go to zero as u goes to infinity, as long as j is less than this number. So you take into account this rule, and um, you do this, and um, you know, it turns out that uh, you can actually see um, there's non-trivial value of j such that this is true. And these, this is exactly basically how we determine all the answers to the examples that we, that we presented, that are presented. There are um, many more slides where I have made these remarks and uh, ideas of the proof, but uh, I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Oh, um, basically, if you don't have it, um, okay, first of all, if you don't have it, you don't expect to have um, you know, global solutions to, in the first place. But second, um, even in our proof, um, if you don't have null condition, then the recurse ODs gets messed up. That's, that's where it enters, yeah. No, it's not spherical symmetry. No, yeah, so blue, you should, you should just forget about blues. Um, this red is something that holds, um, you know, generally. Ah, you're, you're asking about um, the projection to the L spherical mode? Hmm? Yes, um, because this actually makes sense because, uh, you know, even though the background is not necessarily spherically symmetric, this is actually objects that are defined on null infinity. And we're assuming some, you know, uh, asymptotic flatness. So, you know, there, you know, things are perfectly spherical symmetry. So we're using the, um, the sphere at infinity, so to speak, to define these. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course, yes, yes, it's relative to suitable gauge. There's already a very nice work of um, Hans, um, which shows that um, in, in wave gauge, the rate that you expect for the metric is t to the minus one, which is, you know, which is drastically different from the expectation that I gave. So this must be formulated in the proper way. One way to say this maybe is um, in terms of um, like curvature, uh, while curvature, um, yeah, if you wanna be concrete. Um, so, but then, you know, like at the level of the metric, of course it will depend on the, on the gauge, you're right, yeah. 